be together. Let's stand together and worship.
of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing all the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after.
aside and to worship you. We thank you for all the ways that you've blessed us in the country that we live in, that we're free to worship you. Thank you for the joy that we can experience and the new life we can experience because of your son. We pray that as we continue today, that that joy would be very present in our lives and we would be ever reflecting on who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Keely, and we are on location this morning at Wellspring Park with one of our ministry partners, Transact Hope. And here to tell us a little bit more about Transact Hope is Chris Cook. Hi, Chris. Hi, Keely, and thank you so much for having me today to talk about our ministry. Uh, Transact Hope has been around for about 12 years. Uh, about three years ago, they bought the old Thompson Mobile Home Park and we renamed it Wellspring Park. The ministry is geared to helping people get back on their feet that may have been through very tough times in their life with uh, addiction or abuse or just fighting poverty. So we are not a relief or rehabilitation center, uh, but we work with folks that have come out of that counseling and are ready to start rebuilding their lives. Uh, we focus on the word of Jesus Christ and encourage them to be a part of a uh, church in the community. Uh, we work with them on budgeting. We work with partners like uh, Jobs for Life, Faith and Finance uh, to help them get ready to, in effect, rebuild their life. We provide them with uh, housing, which we'll take a look at in a minute, uh, to give them an opportunity um, to get back on their feet and work towards a home of their own. So that's a lot of mouthful <laughs> in a very short period of time, but uh, no, that's amazing. We would love to take you inside one of the units that is currently being refurbished. Let's take a walk. All right. We are here inside one of the units that is currently being refurbished. And, and Chris, there's a lot of work going on in here and it probably takes a ton of people to make that happen. So could you tell us a little bit more about how to get involved, what it looks like to be involved with Transact Hope? Sure. Um, as I mentioned before, um, a couple of the churches in the areas do support us, but we really survive on the, the volunteering of individuals. Um, if you're able to swing a hammer, a paintbrush, help install floors, mow a lawn, uh, even help deep clean units before um, a new participant moves in, we need all that help. Uh, we have a handful of us that uh, enjoy getting together and working on that, but we can always use more help along that line. You can go to 
transacthope.org, the website. It will tell you much more about the ministry and give you contact opportunities through that. That's a good way to get started, Keely. Okay, great. So if you think that that is something you could do, we'd love for you to also head on over to the What's Happening page for more information and ways to get connected. Hey, if you are new here this morning, welcome. We want to just say thank you for joining us and being a part of our service this morning. And just a reminder that next Sunday, July 10th at noon in the chapel is Discover Woodlands. And so we want to invite you to come to that if you have not had the chance to do so already. Thanks so much for being with us. All right. Good morning. It's good to see all of you today. Sort of. Can see me, right? There you go. <laughs> We're working on it. Uh, before we dive into uh, the, the message this morning, I want to just bring a little couple pieces of good news. Uh, one of them is... Uh, you know, uh, if you were here last Sunday, you saw that Pastor Matt, it was his last Sunday as our worship pastor here. He's leading worship down in Fitchburg in the Madison area today. But the good news is that two pieces. One, we have a great team of volunteers who you saw on stage this morning that will continue to lead us into worship. And another piece of great news, yeah, indeed. Let's give him a round of applause. And another piece of good news is that three weeks from today, on the 24th of July, we have a new worship pastor candidate who will be here all the way from Mississippi. And uh, so we're going to tr- uh, hand out Southern translators to all of you. Uh, <laughs> no, he actually grew up in the St. Louis area, so he's, uh, he's good. Uh, and anyway, he and his wife are on their way, and so we're trusting that he might be the guy that God's going to put in our church to lead us in the worship area for years to come. Uh, And then a second piece of good news, we have another pastor that we just hired, well actually his first day is on Tuesday, and he's going to be serving, uh, giving leadership to the area of pastoral care ministries, and his name is, come back next Sunday and I'll tell you, uh, because we'll actually introduce him on the stage, we'll actually get to meet him, but we're excited that we have a new pastor that's going to be joining our staff and we want to introduce him to you next week. Uh, That's the good news, and then a, a final piece of good news is Today, or tomorrow, I should say, is our country's birthday, 200 and something, uh, and 46, right? Is that right? 246, something like that. And uh, anyway, uh, we want to pray for our country. Good news is we've been singing this morning those songs about God's faithfulness, and man, has God been faithful to our country, right? Uh, I love our country. I trust that you do as well. I'm so proud and happy to be an American citizen. And I encourage you to be praying for our country. Uh, And so we're going to do that together this morning. So I would invite you to join me as we pray for America today. So let's pray. Jesus, uh, on this holiday weekend, we want to pause and uh, pray for the United States of America. We are privileged to be part of this great country. We don't consider ourselves better than any other peoples around the world. We don't consider ourselves better than other countries, but we're just thankful that we get to be part of this great country. And uh, so we, um, we pray for our leaders today. You tell us in your words explicitly and clearly to pray for leaders, for all those who are in authority. Um, these are challenging days. There's deep differences of opinion in our country about many things. Uh, There's challenges that our country faces from the economy to war over in Europe to lots of different things happening in the world. And uh, so we pray for our leaders that you would give them wisdom to lead well. We pray that you would give our country a renewed sense of unity and commonness of purpose and patriotism and a sense of commitment to this great country of ours that we are privileged to be a part of. God, we pray that uh, by your grace, uh, you would protect us from the kinds of things that have in the past destroyed other countries. And so we pray that you just protect our nation and enable us to be a free people for many years to come so that in that freedom, we as an American people who are living out our faith can proclaim you, Lord Jesus, to the ends of the earth uh, from the base of this great place of freedom. So we thank you today for uh, the freedom that we have. We thank you for this country and its leaders, and we pray that it would be blessed by you going forward as it has been blessed by you in the past. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, right, that you have to have the secret sauce. It's all about the secret sauce. 
If you're making a chicken sandwich, you have to have Chick-fil-A sauce. It's the secret sauce. Good, good thing you can get it in Walmart now, because if you have a chicken sandwich and you don't have Chick-fil-A sauce, it's just not quite as good. If you're barbecuing chicken on your grill over the 4th of July, July weekend, you have to have the right barbecue sauce. Now, I don't want to tell you what that is, because that could lead to a fight, and we don't want to do that on Sunday morning. You all have your own, but you know you have to have the secret sauce, the right one. I am going to introduce a secret sauce to you that many of you probably don't know about, and that is... If you go to a Chinese restaurant, Kathy and I love to eat Chinese food. If you go to a Chinese restaurant, as we did a couple week, a week and a half ago uh, to celebrate our 42nd anniversary, Kathy ordered beef with broccoli. Oh, it's so good if they have the secret sauce. But she forgot to look on the description to see if it really had the secret sauce. And turns out it didn't. And that was just, just a chunk of beef with broccoli and salt and pepper, and it wasn't all that great. This was not a restaurant here in town, by the way. So what is the secret sauce? Those of you who cook Chinese know it's oyster sauce. Now, that may sound horrible to you, right? You're thinking, he's lost his mind. But if you ever cook up broccoli and beef and Chinese oyster sauce, you'll feel like you've died and gone to heaven. Uh, So you need to have the secret sauce. I tell you that because we're going to talk about the secret sauce of joy this morning. We're finishing up a series here at Woodlands Church called The Joyful Christ-Centered Life. And as we come to the last chapter of the book of Philippians, we are introduced to the secret sauce of joy. The thing that you have to have in your life if you're going to walk in joy. One of the great things that we've learned in this series is that God actually wants us uh, more than wants us, he commands us to walk in joy. Isn't that, isn't that cool? You know, when you think about the commands of God, I think a lot of times when people think about the commands of God, they think of, don't do this, do this. It can feel sometimes oppressive or hard. And yet we know they're all for our good. But imagine that God actually commands us and says, I want you to be joyful. And I've worked for you and continue to work for your joy. And in Ephesians chapter 4, or excuse me, in Philippians chapter 4 today, as we wrap up this book about joy, we're going to learn about the secret sauce of joy. And here it is. It's one word. And if you don't have it, you'll be like this, this jar, vase, beaker, whatever you want to call it. You'll feel empty. You won't be able to experience the kind of joy that God wants you to unless it's filled with the secret sauce. And the secret sauce is peace. If you see in the Bible, there's often a close correspondence between peace and joy. Even in the fruit of the Spirit, it says that the Spirit produces in us, and here's the order, love, and then the next two, joy and peace. Those two are closely linked together. Well, there are two kinds of peace that are brought out in Philippians chapter 4. And if you, if you lack either of these two kinds of peace, you'll probably be lacking in joy. You might be feeling a bit empty like this jar this morning in terms of your joy level if either of these two pieces are missing. And so we want to look at two different kinds of peace this morning from Philippians chapter 4. The first one is the peace that I'm calling relational peace. It's, it's peace between your family members. It's peace between your friends. It's peace between the important people in your life. Because you know that if you are in a conflict with someone, if there's tension in a relationship, it's really hard if that relationship matters to you at all. And it's fractured, it's ruptured, it's broken, it's in a difficult place. It's really hard to be filled with joy because that thing, that fractured, broken, difficult relationship is is right before your eyes. You wake up thinking about it, you go to bed thinking about it, it can worry you, it can make you angry, it can depress you depending on the source of that conflict. So if you don't have relational peace, it's going to be tough to have joy. Fortunately, God's word this morning is going to teach us about how to have relational peace. It's also going to teach us, by the way, spoiler alert, it's going to teach us that sometimes peace is very, very difficult to obtain. And sometimes, perhaps even impossible. But even when it's impossible, there's a way forward to joy in the area of relational peace. So open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse 1. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live together in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true comrade, I ask you to help these women. Help them what? They, they had a struggle. There was a relational conflict. I ask you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle or reasonable or gracious spirit be known to all men because the Lord is near. There's four things I want to draw out of these verses that lead us into an understanding of relational peace. First thing I want to draw to your attention is that this, was a, this is the central issue of these five verses. In verse two, he says, I urge Euodia, I urge Syntyche to live in harmony. Literally, that means to think about each other in the same way, to think in a healthy way, to be united. It's the ancient's way of saying, be together, stop the conflict, let the conflict be healed. It was so important that he speaks to this person called true comrade or true companion. We don't know who that is, probably another church leader along with Euodia and Syntyche. And he says to this other church leader, help these women, help them get past this. Because remember, a big theme about, uh, of Philippians is a theme about joy. And they weren't in it. They weren't having it because they were at odds with each other. And so he says, I, I urge you to uh, do this. Now imagine, I want you to imagine something. We don't tend to think about this, but imagine how this letter came to this church in Philippi. So this is, this, they, don't, they didn't have Bibles. They didn't send, you know, they just had a letter that came. And so, you know, one of the leaders stood up and he read from chapter one all the way through to chapter four. This is a letter, right? And all of a sudden, the whole church is gathered together. And all of a sudden, he says, I urge you, Odia and Syntyche, who are sitting over there on the right side, to live in harmony, to stop fighting with each other. <laughs> now, just imagine what that, imagine if I pointed up to that upper balcony and I said, Joe, John, stop fighting. Joe and John and many of you who would look at each other and say, this is just a little too real for me. I'm leaving, right? But this is a small church. Everybody knew that there was a conflict between these two. There wasn't nothing being revealed here. This is, you know, probably a church of under 100. The church is just getting going. Listen, I grew up in a small place. I grew up in Junction City, Wisconsin, 381 people when I was a kid. When I was 14 years old, I could jump on my bike in Junction City, ride around town, and I could tell you who lived in at least half of the houses, and I could tell you something about them. Some things they maybe didn't want me to know. But that's the nature of a small town. Everybody kind of knows everybody's business in this church. So he wasn't revealing any secret. He was simply saying, we need to fix the conflict. And then right after he says that, he says, rejoice in the Lord. You can't rejoice in the Lord if this is going on. So the first thing I want you to notice, this is a central issue. The second thing I want you to notice is three times, I don't know if you notice this, three times are three critical commands in these five verses, and they all end with the little phrase, in the Lord. Let's look at them again, verse one. Stand firm in the Lord, that's verse one. Verse two, live in harmony in the Lord. That's verse two. Verse four, rejoice in the Lord. So three times he uses this little phrase, wraps it into a command, in the Lord. And he's reminding them that you are a Christ follower and a Christ follower is someone whose life is built around the person of Jesus Christ. He's the most important person to us. We live for him. It's a statement of commitment. Your life is lived in the presence of Christ. And so at the beginning, he says, stand firm in the Lord. At the end, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And it's this picture of relationship with Jesus, with Jesus. And so it's easy to think that the Christian life looks like this, looks like you and Jesus just together, rejoicing in the Lord, standing firm in the Lord. He's my God. He's my King. It's me and Jesus. Recently, I was having my personal devotional time sitting on our front porch, which I usually do early in the morning, and I was reading Psalm 27, where in verse 4, the psalmist says, one thing I've 
ask from the Lord and that I will seek, that I can dwell in the house of the Lord to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. And just you and me, Jesus, you know, early morning sun's come up and I, that's the Christian life, right? Well, yes, but it's not all the Christian life. Here's another picture of the Christian life. Imagine all of you in this room coming up on the stage. And now suddenly, we're not alone anymore. I don't think we could fit all of you up here. That's the Christian life too. We're called to be in relationship with each other. It's not just me and Jesus. It's me and Jesus, it's me and you, it's me and you together in Jesus. So maybe a better picture of the Christian life is because all of you are here as my brothers and sisters in Christ. I actually have to sit down sometimes and talk with you. And sometimes that's not easy, is it? Sometimes that's just ridiculously challenging to be in a relationship, but that's part of the Christian life too. And so if we're not resolving relationships with our brothers and sisters, don't expect that joy is gonna rise up in your life because that conflict will be right here for you. Okay, you get the picture, so I'm done with those two chairs. The third thing I want you to notice in these commands is that there is a unique tension in the first command and the second command. The first command says, stand firm in the Lord. In other words, have your convictions about what it means to be a Christ follower. Don't waver in your faith. Be someone who believes and knows and lives out the Bible. Convictions, commitments, character, all of those kinds of things are part and parcel of the Christian life. Have those, stand firm in Jesus. But there's a tension with the second command. Live in harmony with one another in the Lord. Because some of your convictions are a little bit different than mine. Some of your way of life is a little bit different than mine. Not wrong, just different. Just different ways of living out our faith, just different choices that each one of us make. And so stand firm in the Lord, have convictions, has to be melded together with live in harmony with each other. Be gracious to each other. Be kind with your convictions to each other because it's not just you and Jesus, it's you and your brothers and sisters as well. Another way to think about this, these two commands, stand firm in the Lord, be strong in Jesus, that's truth, but live in harmony with each other, that's grace. Remember what John chapter one says about Jesus? It said he is full of grace and truth. This is the trick, if you would, of the Christian life is to live out our faith with firm convictions, but to live them out graciously with one another, kindly with one another, gently with one another. That's why perhaps in Ephesians chapter four, verse 16, it talks about how we will grow up together. And it says this, it says, we are to speak the truth, stand firm in the Lord to each other, but it says in love. Speak the truth in love to each other. Those two, grace and truth, grace, truth, and love, those two have to go together in the Christian life. Or else, in just terms of our joy, we're just going to stay empty because we're going to be fighting with people. There's going to be a lot of conflict in our lives if we don't learn to put these two commands together well. The fourth thing I want you to notice is that this is where he ends this, this little discussion about living in relational peace. He ends it by introducing a word that's a very complex word in the Greek language. Uh, And here's here's how it reads in some of your Bibles. It says, let your gentle spirit be known to all people. I love what one commentator wrote about this word. He said that the word gentle here is difficult to translate with its full connotations. Such English translations as gentle, yielding, kind, forbearing, lenient, are among the best English attempts, but no single word, he writes, is adequate. Involved, and here's a great summary, he says, involved in this word is the willingness to yield one's personal rights and to show graciousness, consideration, and gentleness to others. That's why many translations of verse five say, let your reasonable spirit be known to all people. In other words, live out your faith those firm convictions that you have, 
with gentleness, with kindness, with reasonableness, with a realization that other people aren't always going to agree 100% with you and, me, and may be fully great followers of Jesus. They just see things a little bit differently than you do. So we're going to learn a verse together this morning. This is so important. It's commanded many times in Scripture to be at peace with all men. You're going to memorize a verse with me right now. Revelation, uh, sorry, Revelation, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Romans 12, 18. Here's the phrase of Romans 12, 18. Be at peace with all men, or let's say people. Be at peace with all people. That's easy to, to learn, right? Be at peace with all people. There it is. It's command of God. It's in the present tense. Be at peace. This is how we are to live as Christ followers. Relational peace. Be at peace with all people. I'm going to even ask you to say, can you say that? Be at peace with all people. There you go. But you know what? That's not the whole verse. The whole verse is wonderfully realistic. Here's how the verse actually starts. There are three phrases. That was the last one. Be at peace with all people. Here's the first one. If possible. Oh, so sometimes it's not, right? I mean, that's a conditional clause, and that has brought me great comfort through the years. Sometimes it's just not possible to be at peace with everybody. So the Bible says, God says to us, if possible, first phrase, third phrase, be at peace with all people. Well, if the first phrase, the first conditional clause is not enough, God put a second conditional clause in there. Here's the whole verse. If possible... So far as it depends on you, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you've done everything you can to be at peace, and you can't be at peace with all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. That's a great verse, because the weight of the command is still, I need to make relational peace. But there's a graciousness from my Father in heaven who says, it may not be on you. You might not be able to at all times. There's even some examples of that in Scripture. Do you remember the story in the Bible, in the book of Acts, of Paul and Barnabas? The great apostle Paul, who God inspired to write Romans chapter 12, and God inspired to write the book of Philippians, had a conflict that he couldn't resolve. Paul and Barnabas, remember? Paul and Barnabas went on a missionary journey. They had a guy with them named Mark, and Mark couldn't take the pressure of the missionary journey. At some point in the middle of their missionary journey, he kind of left. He just walked away from this difficult ministry that they were involved in, and Paul felt abandoned. But Barnabas, whose very name's name means the encourager, never gave up on Mark. And so when a second missionary journey was in the works and they were picking their team, Barnabas said to Paul, let's bring Mark along. And Paul turned to him and said, are you crazy? He deserted us on the first missionary journey. We're not taking Mark. And Barnabas said, give him another chance. He's a brother made in the image of Christ. Be gracious, be kind. Paul said, be firm, be solid in your convictions. I'm not taking him. Well, why not? You should. And it says there arose such a clatter. No, that's something else. Uh, There arose such a conflict that they went on two different missionary journeys. But here's the really cool thing. At the end of Paul's life, he writes and asks for Mark to come and help him because really Barnabas was probably right in this one. Barnabas was the guy that saw in Mark what Paul should have seen in him, and Mark became useful. In fact, Paul says that. Send Mark to me at the end of his life because he's useful to me for service. But what I want you to see is that (laughs) these two great men of God had a conflict they couldn't resolve. If possible, so far as it depends on you, Sometimes it doesn't be at peace with all men. Or consider this one. At the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4, when Paul is giving instructions to Timothy about how he's going to live his life as the leader of the Ephesian church, here's what he writes in verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed us. Paul never found relational peace with Alexander, the coppersmith. So if possible, be at peace with all men. If it depends on you, and oftentimes it does, be at peace with all men. But sometimes it doesn't. 
So relational peace, it's vital to our faith. So the first part of the secret sauce, it's in here, is relational peace. I brought this uh, ocean water from the Bahamas. Doesn't that kind of look like, like a, I wanted you to feel at peace today. Doesn't that kind of look like a little, do you see that pretty aqua blue green in there? Maybe I'll put a little bit more in there. But here's the thing. It's only half full. There's something else that can swirl around inside of your life that even if you're relationally at peace with everybody in your world, there's something else that could rob your joy. So there's a second kind of peace that we need that Philippians is going to talk about. I'm going to call it, my word, personal peace. You might call it internal peace if you like that word better. But it's that sense inside of you that you are at peace with the way your life is playing out. If relational peace is the absence of conflict and tension, personal peace is the absence of worry, the absence of anxiety, and the absence of discontent. It is trusting acceptance. This is what personal peace is. It is a trusting acceptance that what God has given and what God is doing in my life is best for me. And I'm going to rest in him. Personal peace. This is where the book of Philippians turns next. It turns away from a discussion about relational peace to a, re- a discussion about internal peace. Let's look at it. Go back to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to read a couple of verses now that are so familiar to many of you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, this is that internal peace. He's not talking about relational peace. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding or comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. These are such incredible promises, such an incredible command followed by a promise. Be anxious for nothing. Drive out internal discontent, internal anxiety, worry. How do you do that? By prayer, supplication. Make sure that that prayer and supplication is peppered with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God comes. You know, God will use those words in our lives to help us get to a place of peace and joy in a, in a few different ways. Here's one. Sometimes, and this has been helpful to me in my life, just to, and I know to many of you as well, sometimes on, when I take my time of prayer and take a walk, and, and I'm trying to pray, and I start thinking about the things that I'm anxious about, thinking about, wondering how they're going to turn out, kinds of things, the Lord brings this concept to mind. and says, just kind of give it to me. Let your requests be made known to God, peppered with thankfulness, and then the peace of God. So sometimes what this verse is telling us to do, and sometimes what, the way that works out for us, is we take that anxiety about, you know, what's coming with my job, what's coming with my finances, what's coming with my health, what's coming with my family. We take the anxiety about those things, say, God, I give this to you. And sometimes when you pray, he just kind of takes it and lifts it. And he just lifts the anxiety and he lifts the worry and he lifts the fear. I've had that happen thousands of times. Knowing that it's in the hands of my father can lift anxiety. That's what these verses are saying. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God will then guard your hearts. Sometimes that's what happens when you do this. But sometimes another thing happens. I had this happen just two weeks ago. Sometimes when you lift up those anxiety-producing, worrisome things in your life to the Lord, you give them to him, sometimes he gives them back to you. Wait, what? Time out. I don't like like that, right? Well, let me explain. I was sitting on my front porch, and I was trying to read the Bible about two weeks ago. And have you ever tried to read the Bible and you read the same verses like 12 times? And just nothing enters in because there were four things that I was thinking about. There were four things that just, I'd be reading the words and I said, I have no idea what I just read. And that's real life for Brian, maybe not for you, uh, but for me. And 
So I thought, I need to give this to the Lord. I, said, I, I need to stop reading and start praying. So I gave him to the Lord, and the Lord said, do something about it. He brought to mind, like, there were, of the four things, there was something I could do about three of them that very day. Do something about it. Stop sitting here worrying. Stop telling me you're giving it to me when you haven't done what you need to do with this thing. And that was very helpful for me. So by the end of that day, I had done three simple things and that anxiety had lifted. It reminded me of the great, some of you guys who are around the church a while, remember that years ago we did a curriculum around here for our men's groups called Men's Fraternity. And in Men's Fraternity, we, uh, had to, we, came, we came to learn a definition for biblical manhood. And I've always remembered this. It's a great definition. Even if you're a, a, a gal here today, a woman, I think this can help you as well. But for us as men, this, this helps me. The definition of biblical manhood is this. This is what biblical men do. We reject passivity. We accept responsibility. We lead courageously. And we look to the reward that Christ our King will give us. And I was sitting on my porch passive that morning. And I needed to reject passivity and do something about the anxiety that was in my life and take responsibility, lead courageously to help deal with those things. And then... then God will use that sometimes as well. But really what's in view here in verses four through six, or five, six and seven, excuse me, is we talk to God about what creates discontent, which creates worry, anxiety. We give it to him and sometimes he just takes it. Sometimes he gives it back and says, here's a solution for that. That's what happened for me that morning. Sometimes when you give it to God, a third thing can happen. He'll lead you into the next verses in Philippians because there's something else you can do besides simply give it to the Lord. Let's read on in verse eight and following. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and me practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So when you give something that's causing inner turmoil over to the Lord, another thing that these verses remind us is we need to think about what's pure and lovely and honorable and good and holy. That's the Lord, first of all. But it's also the things that he calls us to do because sometimes what we need to do is get out in our minds. We need to get out of the what ifs. That's what creates anxiety. Get out of the what ifs. What if this? What if that? What if this happens? And get into the what is. What is God like? What is the good that he's put into my world? What is the the good God who's over me, before me, around me, leading me? What is he like? He's lovely, he's pure, he's holy, he's good. He's all those things. So when I give him my struggle, it's going to lead to some peace when I remember who he is. I always remember reading years ago, uh, Hudson Taylor is a missionary name that some of you will remember. He's a missionary to China uh, in the 1800s. He was from England, and uh, several years into his ministry there in China, his wife died, his beloved wife died. And Hudson Taylor wrote very honestly about the anxiety, the fear, the, the pain that came in his life when his wife passed away. And he did this incredible analogy, probably because he grew up in a seafaring nation, England, where there are ships all over. He was aware of this thing. He said, anxiety, worry, grief, are like barnacles that grow on a boat. If you don't know what a barnacle is, it's a parasite, a marine parasite that grows on boats. As recently as 2021, the United States Navy wrote about the devastating effect of barnacles on their ships. If they're not cleaned off, they can reduce fuel efficiency by 60%. Imagine that. Imagine them with the price of fuel. Anyway, I'm, I'm wandering far afield here. So he said, grief and worry, it's like barnacles. They, they are on the boat, and you give them to God, and he takes them away, and then all of a sudden, two or three days later, the barnacles are back. And you got to clean them off again. you got to give them back to God again. He says, I have given my grief over the loss of my wife to the Lord a hundred times, two hundred times. And he takes it, but then it comes like great waves of emotion or anxiety or fear. That's just 
the normal Christian life. But as we keep reminding ourselves who God is, as we keep practicing Ephesians 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9, he restores our peace and he restores our joy. There's one uh, final section in here, one final thing that leads to internal peace, and it's that word contentment. This is where Paul the Apostle turns next. He's thanking them for a financial gift he received from them, and here's what he writes, verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, but I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret I have learned the secret of having abundance or suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Go back to verse 11. Not that I speak from one. I've learned to be content. Two times he uses the word learned in there. Learning and contentment are linked together. Contentment is something that by the grace of God, through his work in your life, you can learn to experience. And he says it is through Christ. It is through Christ. We learn to be satisfied with who he is. We learn to be satisfied with what he has done in our lives and we trust him. This pastor in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Andy Stanley, some of you have listened to his stuff. I always remember hearing him talk about people who lose someone in a relationship. They're in a relationship with someone and they lose someone and their whole life is built around that relationship whether it's through marriage that ends in divorce or marriage that ends in death or a dating relationship that you thought was heading toward marriage and it suddenly ends up in a breakup. There's lots of tight relationships that blow apart and it blows apart your world. And Andy Stanley said, when I counsel someone like that, I always start with one piece of counsel and that is don't rush back into a relationship to try and fill that hole. As best as you are able, take at least a year and learn to let Christ satisfy you. Learn to be content with who Jesus is in your life. It's not that a second relationship is wrong or bad, but don't just rush off and grab someone because Christ wants to be that someone for you. Learn to be content with him. Paul says, I've learned through Christ. I can do everything through Christ. I've learned to be content. What's he saying? He's saying, because Christ has become enough to me. So whether he gives me a lot or he gives me a little, I've learned to be content because we all know the secret truth about contentment, right? Contentment is not based on what you have. You can have a whole bunch of stuff and not be content or you can have very little stuff and be content. Here's how one person put it. Contentment is not determined by the multiplicity of your possessions. Contentment is determined by the simplicity of your wants. That's a great word. Contentment is not determined by the multiplicity of your possessions, but rather by the simplicity of your wants. We learn to be content in Christ. Let me close with this this morning. We love to... um, We love to quote, if you know the psalm, we love to sit in. I love to sit in this psalm. I love to sit in Psalm 16, especially at the end where it talks about joy. One of the great verses on joy is from the book of Psalms. In Psalm 16, it says this, verse 11, the last verse of the psalm. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. Well, that's a great verse that talks about joy, right? Well, maybe we need to back up in the psalm and read what he said first. In in uh, verse 5 of Psalm 16, he said this, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage My assignment, my inheritance from you is beautiful to me. The psalmist is using the analogy that the people of his day would have understand that when Israel went into the promised land, they cast lots 
for this land, and they divided it up. So tribe of Judah, they cast a lot. Judah, this is your territory. The psalmist is saying, the way God has ordered and provided for my life, I will be content with. The lines of his inheritance, what he's given to me, have fallen to me in beautiful places because ultimately he's my inheritance. That's personal peace. So, here you go. Put in the personal peace as well as the relational peace and there's some joy. Just don't come up on stage and drink that when you're done. Well, let's pray together. Let's stand and pray. Jesus, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the truth that you want us joyful and you want us to experience the kind of peace that leads to that. So we pray, Jesus, that by your grace, whether we need to fix a relationship that's broken, would you help us with that? Whether we need to trust you and work to drive out anxiety, worry, or discontent, help us with that so that we might experience the kind of joy that you intended for us. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's respond together.
your kingdom to those around us. We pray that as we go from here that we would be peacemakers, that we would experience the joy and peace that only comes from you. Pray that we wouldn't search for that in any other place, but that it would be exclusively done by your hands. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Have a great Sunday.